So anyhow, hey, I hope everyone's doing well. Uh, tonight we're pl I'm planning on doing a making something in 3D. It basically br starts to bring together a lot of things that we've already talked about in the class. Traditionally, if we were all in the classroom, this would be a tremendous hands-on project. So we'll see how it goes. Obviously, I'll show you project number two is we're due tonight. And um, we will be um, also talking about project number three um, after, after I, we get going. So I'm going to do that a little bit later in the evening just to ensure more people have a chance to get here and stuff. I hope you're all healthy and doing well. If everybody could make sure that you got your chat screen open so you can type in questions and everybody give me a hello here or whatever for a little bit of a roll thing on the chat system. Outstanding and stuff. As you can see by the uh, PDF in front of the, on your screen, the uh, two things to download and definitely do go to Canvas and download the creating dice.pdf. That way you can follow along with what I'm doing this evening. The um, files that I'm doing tonight are on the class download 3D cubed underscore dice uh, with today's date. I think I should probably go back in there and redate everything by date first and then what it is. But that's for another day and stuff. Okay, let's go ahead and get started in talking about this. Why don't we choose to start with two days? But where are you? All right. Like I said, this is traditionally a very hands on evening. We use this, uh, this is the PDF, which gets into how to set up the composition how we're going to create the dice and stuff. The specific project is fairly straightforward, but it's designed to cover all the information you need to remember about 3D. Okay, such as how to activate the cube here, do a lot of the other things going on. We're also gonna be doing a lot of pre-composing and playing with lights and stuff eventually when we get there. So that's what we're doing tonight. Okay, I've already made a composition. The composition is composition settings is a standard NTCSDV, by the way. Definitely do this size because all the numbers on that PDF are based on the 720 by 480 width. And if you adjust this, these numbers, the numbers won't line up exactly for you, or you may have some issues. Okay. Now basically I've got several quite six six PowerPoint, not PowerPoint, six Photoshop files, which I'm going to drag down to my timeline. Okay. And the first thing that we're going to do is just do a quick reorganization. So we have side one, two, three, four, five and six. So these all correspond to the layers they're on. And basically we are going to start by building a six sided die. I discovered this, got this idea for the project just because in dealing with it, it's easy uh, to talk about these things. Cause when I talk about the one, the two, the three, whatever side die I'm talking about, you know, it's just obvious on the screen. So the first thing I'm going to do is activate all the 3D layers. I am going to split this into two views because we're going to look at this from two different, several different angles. Let's go this side, full screen, this side. Good. There we go. So this is what the camera's seeing and this is from the top view. Remember this little title up there. Okay. Now the other thing that I did with all these was zoom in up here. Is I made all these Photoshop files exactly the same, 200 by 200, which makes life a lot easier when trying to do the math and stuff. 
Now, before I begin, I do want to point out, even though I have numbers and all these other fun things um, in my handout, students often ask me saying, can't I just eyeball this? Can I just make the cube? And if it looks good, it's good. And the answer is, yeah, you can. But then again, sometimes it's just easier to know that if something is 200 by 200, that um, that's definitely, you know, nice, easy size. When you make files in Photoshop, it's often easier if you do keep things a standard size, you know, if you have to do, because if you look at this dice and say, what's the center of the die? Well, if you know it's 200 by 200, you know, it's in there 100, right? So math is much easier when dealing with this. Now, the first side, side number one, we're actually going to lock down. That has absolutely no numbers that we're going to deal with. Number two, we're going to play with, okay? Basically, in instance, we're going to, we're going to try to do the problem. Okay, we're going to put side number two on the back side of the die. So we're gonna bring up the position and this is Z space, we're moving it back away from that. Now, because the die is the same size on every side, how far back do we have to move this? Obviously, 200 pixels, go. And you can see now that side number two is that far out. You can see it's away from the camera, so it looks smaller on the camera side. And that's all we have to do. Now these other sides, however, we're gonna to have to do a little bit more with them. We need to do what? We need not, need not, let's try that again. We need to move them back, but we also need to do rotations on them as well. Now this is where my handout, you know, you gotta be very careful in reading this through and understanding, you know, where everything's hiding on here. So we're gonna go ahead and open up number three. And we're going to we're going to go into rotation to start with, and we're going to rotate the x ninety degrees because these are all right angles to each other. So technically speaking, that is the top. Okay, so we can now see number one. We see, you know, this is the whirly gig and the line for number three. And from the top view, of course, we can see this. How far back do we need to move this? Well, position wise, what? We need to move it back 100 pixels. Okay, however, notice from the front position, what's wrong with this? Well, if I immediately come over here and change this from top view to custom view, ah, when I rotated it, notice that of course it just rotated where it was. And since it rotated in the middle, it's over. So what I have to do position wise is what? I've got to move it up 100 pixels. Okay, so I can make this the top one. So if I know that's X, Y, and Y currently is at 240, I need to make that 340. I drove it down, sorry. 140, let's go up. So that is now my, you know, first side, second side, third side. And if I look at this from the left angle, you can see how my cube is slowly coming together. Okay, so I'm gonna go back here. It's actually not a bad angle. I'm gonna leave it on the left side for the moment. Now notice I'm also locking down my sides because I don't want to start accidentally moving things around. So my side number four, I'm gonna go into position. And just to show you, like I said, this, this handout normally does, like I said, take most of the evening. We'll see how this goes tonight. Is there's all the things just to get to step number side three. And then I just wrap it up with, these are the numbers you need for uh, the last few and stuff. So, so for side number four, I need an X rotation, uh, position first. Let's do position first. 
So the position for x will be 360. X ninety, and I'm going to go back into position. Now I need to slide that back, so it needs to go back. And like I said, you can't do this manually. I mean, you can just slide that over. but you might be off a little bit. One of the things when you're first doing this, it takes a while to get used to is to zoom in, make sure that things are going the way you want them to. There's no shame in stopping and looking at the details. As a matter of fact, it's critical to do that if you wanna do, do this correctly. Let's go back to custom view and you can see, you know, there's my setup so far which just leaves the two sides. Now, I should point out is where are sides five and six? Well, they're actually exactly on side number one, okay? Remember, these things can collide with each other and exist in the exact same location. Hence, you know, why we can't, one is hiding five and six, if I were to unlock that, that's five hiding underneath in the exact same spot as number one. So number five, let's do the rotation first. It's a 90 degree rotation on the Y axis. Cause I want it to rotate sideways. Whee, there it goes. And like I said, the camera, you can always tell. And from here, the position Two sixty, two forty, and move it back one hundred pixels. So there is my cube coming together. My die. If I go to custom view three, you can see the hollowness. Now, when building things with After Effects, I want to point out that it's good at doing man-made things. It's very bad at designing and doing like organic things. Okay. Hence this die is one of the more simpler things to make, but it does show a lot of the features in getting this all put together. So I'm going to go ahead and lock number five. Go to my number six, my last position. Let's do the rotation first actually, which would be Y90. And position, just saying P for position like I always do. And I want it on the other side of the die, so that's 460 by 240 and, and then zipping it back 100 pixels back. Yeah, I did that in what, <laughs> under 10 minutes. And I've done this a few times, you might say. Okay, this is a good time to open things up for questions. So guys, let me pause there. I know I went through that super freaking fast. But did that makes sense to anybody or did I lose you? Because basically it was just rotating and moving things around until I got things into the cube shape. You're all being quiet tonight. You all logged in, went away. <laughs> and when you watch the video later, you're binging something on Netflix, right? I just know it. No, I'm just teasing you. Okay. So, a couple of things about my die is I want you to look at this for a second. Oops, of course, I locked everything. Wee, let's unlock it. If I were to select all the layers like that, Look at all those handles and stuff. It's a bit unruly, don't you think? I mean, can you imagine trying to animate those six layers simultaneously? It would literally drive you nuts and it's not what to do. 
that's not the way to go and handle this. Okay. The secret in dealing with objects like this in 3D is to actually pre-comp everything once you have things set up. Basically, this is where we're using the composition to group everything together. So by selecting all those layers and going layer pre-composition, I'm just going to simply call this dice because it is one die. I'm going to move all that information into that composition. I get this. Okay, what just happened? And this is something we briefly talked about last week, but I wanted to just point it out. And it's very, very, very important. I'll bring over my handout. Okay, I forgot to step forward. The thing about uh, pre-comping 3D layers into a new composition, and this is going to sound really stupid, but After Effects is not smart enough to recognize that that was once a 3D layer. As a matter of fact, if we go back down here, notice that this is blank. Okay. You would think that After Effects would in default and realize that, oh my, you know, you're pre-comping 3D layers. You must want this to be 3D. No, it does the, quite the opposite, which is darn irritating. So every time you pre-comp something, you got to remember to go back in and make it 3D. But you're about to see something critically important when you're dealing in 3D, which is, and by the way, I see the two questions that just popped up, is this. First, I got to activate the layer. Let's switch that back to custom view one. And immediately you can see the whirly gig in the sense of the up, down, right, left, forward, backwards, X, Y, Z. But notice that the die is still not 3D. Why is that? Once again, because After Effects is stupid. Uh, we have to do two things to make this composition three, fully 3D. And the two things that we have to do is make the layer 3D, but we also have to choose this little thing, which is by the bizarre name, yes, it's called Collapse Transformation in Vector Rasterize. Boy, that was really helpful. You know, it's this little asterisk sunburst. The moment that we have that clicked, then all the 3D information is activated from the previous comp. So the two things we have to do is that and that. And this is why you're going to want my handout because look what I tell you about. There's even a screenshot of it. You got to do these two things whenever you're dealing with 3D and pre-compositions, okay? So that is critically, critically important. If you download my handout for no other reason, it's just for that one screenshot. Okay, now let's, let this. a good question just came up, which was, how do I view this? And this was actually, I always love it when uh, students ask me the question of the next thing I was going to talk about anyhow. It means I have this logically arranged. As many of you know, of course, with the pointer tool, you can grab things and move it around. But you are actually changing the XYZ position for that, which is not normally what you necessarily want to do. You can, with a hand, little hand, either H for hand or grab the little hand up there, you can grab this and it moves the view around. So when you're zoomed in, you can, but it doesn't change where it is inside the, um, you know, inside the actual composition itself. We have another set of tools to help us navigate this. Up at the top of the screen, next to the rotation tool, we have this little camera, which has a drop down menu. I'm going to skip over the camera tool for just a moment and talk about these things. These two and three, excuse me, these three tools allow us to rearrange our viewing without having to change the position of the actual object. If you recall last week, I made a big deal about the idea of being able to walk around your wrong thing here. Come on, for some days it does not want to do its thing. There we go. 
Okay. Remember, the camera is what the audience is going to see. This custom view is us walking around the set, for lack of a better word. Okay, so by using the tools from the drop down menu, the tracking tools, and the orbit tool, for example, the Z tracking camera tool allows us to zoom and zoom out, but notice that my camera is not changing. So if I had a really big object, I could zoom in, zoom out, and see what I'm doing, much like using the hand tool. If I use the XY tracker, this is basically is the hand tool. I'm going left, right, up, down. But again, notice that I am not changing what the audience is seeing. This is me walking around the object, for lack of a better word. And I can always reset it to so you know, get back into things. Okay, the coolest one of all these, though, is the orbit tracker, or orbit camera tool. Even though it's called the camera tool, it allows me actually to move in 3D. I'm actually, what I'm doing is I'm altering this custom view so I can see it from any angle I want to see it from. But again, notice that the camera itself here is not changing. So I'm not changing what the audience is seeing. I'm changing what I'm seeing and how I'm looking at my shape. So it allows me to move things around and I can sit there and say, hey, that looks actually pretty cool. That's, I like it, it's good, let's do this, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, so does that make sense to everybody? Again, I wanna emphasize the difference between Walking around the set, having custom view versus what the camera actually sees. As you saw last week, and we'll get into this in just a little bit, you can put a camera in here and move it around as well. But we'll be dealing with that in just a second here. While I have the orbit tracker out, did anybody else notice that this is kind of looking funky? It's not rotating like a normal dice would. Now, is it? Now, anybody out there want to guess why that is? Yes, you get anchor point, outstanding. Yeah, because the anchor point was at the original start position. Remember how when we first started this up? You know, there it is. So the anchor point is technically on the flat side of the number one die side. So hence when it spins, it is, you know, basically spinning like a loaded die, literally. So one will always be where it's going to. So when you think about this, and I open up the properties down here, transformation, transformation, this is the anchor point. So where should my anchor point really be? It should be in the center of the die, correct? Because you want it quote unquote balanced. So if I come in here and I know that this is 200 pixels by 200 pixels, I can make this move it back 100 pixels. Now, when I grab my orbit tool, you can see that my Anchor point is dead center in the die. Okay. Another good spot to ask questions or anything. Traditionally, like I said, in the class, this would be after you guys all working on it, uh, it'd be closer to 7.30, not closer to 7 o'clock right now. Okay, well, I don't see any questions popping up right at the split second. So let's take this a step farther. Let's actually do something with it. And this is where, you know, my handout, I have a little extra th things. Traditional, say we're going to do a TV commercial for a casino. Sure, why not, right? Oh, don't. My computer, oh, there we go. So I actually have this craps table, which I'm gonna make 3D. 
here. And I'm going to So there's my tabletop GIF. I'm going to go straight, make sure that's, you know, 3D. And here's my rotation and stuff. I'm going to actually put this into a, this is a funky angle. Okay. So I'm intentionally doing this just to give it a special look and feel. But as it says, adjust these numbers as you want to make your thing look. So basically I'm going to do an X rotation at minus 70. And as you may notice, every time you crank in these numbers, it will look terrible until I, you get all the numbers in, okay? Don't panic simply because, you know, it doesn't look good yet, okay? My Z rotation is gonna be plus 65. I'm gonna scale this up to 200%. So it's really big. And I'm going to change the position to make it 280, 215, and move it back a few hundred pixels. So there's, as you can see from the camera angle, that is a little funky, but that's okay. We're going to make it, and then I'm going to lock that down so I don't harass it. Comparatively speaking, my die now is like, Proportionally speaking, not what I really want. So I'm going to instead go into my die, go to scale, and let's drop this down really small, make it like 25%. Does that look better? I think that's not too bad. Okay. All right, now that I've done all that, obviously a crap. Okay, question just came up. Even when I choose my viewer, the top or custom view, it doesn't change. It should. Make sure you've clicked on the, you know, you actually have it selected. And that's a question I'm not sure I can answer without seeing your screen. Sorry about that. Uh, on a, I said, I think I'd have to see your screen and figure out what, what's going on. I should point out, I did have several people contact me over the uh, past week with their project numbers too, with the troubleshooting things. It's really hard troubleshooting things, even with screenshots, just to let you know. You know, imagine if you would, you, I come running up to you and say, hey, there was an accident down the street. What happened? And you'd look at me and go, well, I didn't see it. I don't know. And it's like, the same thing sort of happens when you say, after Effects is not doing X, Y, Z. It's like, okay. <laughs> so bear with me if I can't answer, you know, troubleshoot things automatically. Okay, I, you know, it's just one of those things you just can't do it. Okay, now. What's the easiest way to ensure that all, that all the gaps are closed on the die? It depends upon how far apart they are. This is why the uh, in class time is normally so important because basically I can look at it. Some people just have accidentally typed in the wrong numbers and the sides of their dice are just simply in the wrong place. Sorry about that. Now, other people, it's because, you know, there's just something a little bit off on their uh, composition settings to make this perfect. That's why I was saying that's okay to just grab some one of the sides and make it uh, good you know, to adjust it until it looks fine. All right, any other questions before I move on? Don't see anything at the moment, so. Okay, now obviously for a gambling, you need two set of dice. So I'm just going to take our original and duplicate it. So by clicking on it, I can go duplicate or command D. And I literally have two dice now. There they are. However, it is super freaking confusing to have dice dice. It's much more important to rename these things. So I can like go dice 
Gotcha. Left. Rename it. Right. And I just labeled them backwards, but it's easily fixed. We. So there's my left one. There's my right one. Woo. Careful, don't grab the handles because it will start, you'll create a distortion. Okay. Now, if somebody wants to try Rubik's Cube, go for it. Um, but let's stick with what we're trying to do here now. Again, this is one of the reasons why this project takes so long to do. That's the other thing is when you try to do this uh, at home, following my step-by-step -step instructions, give yourself time. Even though I'm doing it in like 10 minutes, it's because I've done it a hundred times, okay? Don't knock yourself out by saying, you know, it takes time, practice, give yourself that time. Okay, it can take anywhere from an hour and a half to an hour, an hour to an hour and a half normally, unless you're already very good for, at After Effects to do this little simple project. Because what we want to do next is actually have these dice roll, literally. I'd like to have them flying at the camera from up here down to here. Okay, taking a step back, what's the problem with 3D or anything in After Effects is the objects can go through each other. So this die can actually go through that table, no problem. So we have to animate it to make it look like it's actually hitting the table and moving. But we also have another problem here is, when you look at this, are these two dice floating above the table, below, you know, well, obviously they're not through the table, but how are they related to it? The active camera and the custom view do not provide this information. This once again shows why it's totally necessary to alter one's view. So if we go to the like left side, hey, look, they actually are through the table. So if I grab this one, which is my right hand side one, I'm going to move it, drop it down and stuff. And you can see how it's like, I can adjust this. And by using this view, I can figure it out. The other thing that I want to recommend is do not try to animate both of these at the same time. What you really want to do is do them one at a time. So notice what I'm doing here. I'm using the left-hand side view to judge how far back and how high it is. Again, using my camera visual view. And then on the ca camera side, it also can tell me is a better way to judge right and left because you notice when I move it on the X axis here, you can't see it move at all there. No positioning. Okay, so I've got this one. It's still above the table artwork. So I'm going to move it towards the back. I do want to start off the table. So a little bit farther back and that's as far as we want. And I'm going to do the same thing with the other die. I do want that to be a little bit different. Let's move the hand. So technically speaking, they're almost exactly the same for, you know, as far back from each other. And I've got them both a little bit off. This is one of the reasons I tilted the table the way I did. Okay, now we get into animation. And of course, you also get into the question of, do you really want them both starting on the screen at the same time? All right. Now, because we move the anchor point for the first one before we duplicate it into the center, we'll know we'll get a good rolling rotation or a reasonably good one, okay? But I'm not going to do that first. I'm going to try to get my animation going first. I'm gonna start with the left one. I'm gonna choose P for position. And I'm at zero, 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 beginning of my timeline. I'm gonna lock that in the start place for that. So from here, 
my, I'm going to go over that two seconds. I'm going to go over and I'm going to have it come down. And I actually do kind of want a curvature on this, so I'm going to have this. And also I want to judge this on the camera view because if it's coming too close to the, you know, it's like, is it going to look like it's hitting the table or not? I'm also going to click a blank area so I can just see it. And yeah, it just barely hits the edge, but that's okay because I'm going to have this one try to hit over here. And that is my next keyframe. So of course, move over another two seconds. Again, I'll worry about the rolling and stuff. So I'm going to again move it out. I don't want to bounce too high because I don't want to go over. Me want that three seconds. This one, next one. Be a little careful here. I want to make sure that I don't. Let's see how this looks. Boom. Because this next keyframe is actually again it moving over, coming back down again. And again, I want to put a little arc on that. Okay, and then finally, one more second over. I actually want that then to slide a little bit. Ooh, careful. If you can't grab the whirly gig, oh, it's because I'm on the wrong tool. That's why the slide it over just a hair here. Okay. Make that curved path look a little more natural. Now keep in mind, this is not what I would call, you know, television ready. This, you know, I would spend a lot of time doing this. We're just trying to get this done in one night. But you can see, boom, whoo. Now it's a matter of coming in, cleaning up what just happened. So we make sure we line up our keyframes. The other thing that I want to make sure is now I'm going to go into rotation. This is what I want. I want this to hit the table and be flush with it because it should. That flat should line up. There we go. And also, I should have a nice little curve here on this as well. Much, much more. So now I can look at this and go, okay. With that little big curve, it will now be reasonably flush to the table and not going through it. I'm actually going to now <laughs> keyframe that so I know that it will stop at that point. And let's do a little preview of our animation here. Boom, boom. And I'm sure you guys all saw that problem earlier on, right? So that's it sliding, which is kind of like, goes up. Yeah, ghost dice, no kidding. But then when it comes down, this is where we run into this problem, right? There, so I have to come back to this keyframe.
and this is where the curve of the path, you can see that's where the problem is. I just simply have to make sure that it doesn't, it does that instead. This is where the path sort of comes in. Come back in here. Slide's a little funky, but I'll leave it for the moment. Okay, so that gives you an idea. Now I can come back in here. Now my rotation needs to stop here, but I'm gonna come back up here and say, how should this be rotating? It should be sort of spinning to, you know, toward the camera, right? And that's the rotation I want. But I don't want this number to change. So instead I'm gonna hit this and go over to here. So my X rotation is going to be, how many times should it spin? Three times? And I accidentally turned off the stopwatch at some point. My bad. Let's try that again. There we go. So I want, it starts at zero spins. It then goes to three spins. One, two, three. And then it should be at, should be doing more spinning after that. Yep. So now let's look at how that sees. Getting better, getting better. Like I said, this is one of those things about, you know, spending an evening doing something. I'm still not sure about that. So you wanna look at it from the other side. Oops. Slide up here. Scheme of inches, my friends. You just keep playing with it until it looks good. Boom. Slide. What do you guys think? Not bad for a few minutes, right? Or hopefully it's not too bad. Then the next thing to do, of course, is I would then lock that and move on to the next die. Now, the first thing I want to do here is this is a duplicate of that one. So the number one is still pointed. So I might want to rotate this, you know, 180. So a different side of the dice is showing to start with. And now we're going to go back into position again. So zero, 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 position. Z, another mistake, I, you saw the mistake I made. Forgot to move this forward, there we go. Grab that Z, move it forward, move this down. And I want to make sure that these are not, you know, it doesn't look, one doesn't look like cloned of each other. They should have a more organic feel to the, the motion. So that's not too bad. Curvature onto it. And you can also, you know, change where, it, you know, things hit so you get different. So let this go forward a little bit. Have it go like this. Make sure that's keeping it up a little bit. That's the other reason I kept this angle. Four seconds. So moving forward. Down. my curve handle handles here. There we go. And then I'm going to go ahead and 
have it do a slide as well. Come on. Silly thing. Yeah. And having them land in slightly different positions. Now, once I have that, I am now going to adjust the rotation. That one, Eric. There we go. So I can get that. So I know that's reasonably flush. Now I can adjust my little curve. Okay, so now I'm going to pack her up and do a first rough draft here. Well, none of that went too far down into the thing. Now, keep in mind also, I didn't like, I don't like the way that they're almost all, both. I was using the two second, three second, four second, five second markers here. But I can just as easily offset that. So they're moving at slightly different rates of speed. So they don't look too much like each other. The other thing that I might want to do, and I think I am going to do this is up here, is the, even though I rotated it, so the number two is showing, still ended on number three. I'm like, eh, I don't know about that. So, I think I'm going to do it that way. Just do a simple Z rotation. There you go. That way, okay, that looks a little bit better. Okay, now that I have that marked, of course, I can now start playing with those rotations that we were doing earlier. And mark them over back here, down here. I want to keep that. And now I got to go back to here. Actually, the only one I really need to change is the X. So I just want to start at let's go zero, zero. And I want this to spin. I can also change the sp speed of this one by saying, have it spin a little bit more. Let's see how that looks. Oops. So my problem is it went from four back down to zero there. So they're the same number, it shouldn't do that again. That's right. There we go. So how does that feel to everybody? You know, reasonable amount of uh, animation time there. It's a little bit tricky when you try doing this and please do try this handout because it will really help you get the 3D stuff going. And it doesn't look exactly like mine. I hope you saw my troubleshooting on how to get the rotation stuff going and how to position things the way I want them to. Okay. You guys still with me or did I put you to sleep? <laughs> okay. So, you know, we can, of course, jazz this up a little bit more. Nothing says we can't and the handout does for example, if you recall, we can also do lights. For example, I can go layer new light, put spotlight on there, 100%. Cast shadows. Remember, lighting is a two step process. You have to tell it to cast shadows with the light, and you also have to tell the object. And notice that because the light is so close to the table, you don't really see much of the table. Hence, the solution is to, well, obviously, move this. Come on. 
way you're going to be panning the country. There we go. Move the light out. Light up a little bit. And just like I do with the dice and positioning, you can use the different angles here to help you figure out what is the best way to light a scene. Now, one of the things I want to point out now, I'm going to, is this. Why isn't there any shadows with the dice? Well, because the reason for that, quite simply, is the problem is that I have not told it to make have the dice make shadows. But here's the catch. What's going to be making the shadows is not this comp. Notice that there's ge geometry options, but not transform option. But there's no what they call mirror uh, material options. The reason for that is quite simply, the thing that's going to be actually casting the shadows is actually the original Photoshop files. So if I open up just one of these, these files need to be told to cast a shadow. Now there's a fast way to make a fast change on multiple layers, providing that it's the exact same thing that you're changing. If I select all the layers, it means that all the layers will react exactly. Oops, sorry. Exactly the same. So if I open it up, there's my material options. Oops, and I haven't selected everything yet. Or deselected everything. Open up material options. And you can see that the Photoshop files need to be told cast shadows on. And it automatically made that change without even opening these other ones up because once you select one, it does it to all of them. If we go back to the comp, and you can see there's the shadow. There's even another shadow. So let's see what the what the audience would see on this. So we'll go to one view, full screen. Not too shabby. And notice even I screwed up. I think one of these sides is a little bit off, but again, this is just for practice. I'm not doing this for uh, my resume and stuff. Just trying to get you guys going here. So did that make sense to everybody? The few things that we were just doing there. Again, this is a, you know, we're starting to build things and do things with 3D and bring in all the other information that we've already done. And you can see the power behind this, uh, doing these sort of things. You can really do some creative things with After Effects and the 3D. Okay. Now I have a few other things. Can you change the shadow setting? <sighs> The best way to change the shadow is to change the light, is to move the light around to give you a different. Uh, so, for example, two views. Number two. Like so, by moving the light to the far right hand side. The thing about doing the lighting in After Effects, I've had people who have taken stage and they're just amazed that these lights react just the way they would in real life and stuff. So if you think about it, all you have to do is move your light to get a new shadow setting and stuff because it's the light itself actually making the shadow. Okay. Yeah, you can feather the lighting and stuff because that of course is a setting the change in the diffusion, cone feathering, and things like that. By the way, here's a little trick for you. This is not true for all After Effects things, but it's worth checking out every so often. 
Notice that I'm sliding this and I can't go over 100% because it sort of makes sense. Sometimes if you type in, now, sometimes if you type in the number, it will actually let you go over 100, <laughs> you know, just by physically typing it in. But for the light, nope. And there's other things you can play with to get different effects. Use the lighting a little bit. See how the shadow. Now keep in mind also that you're viewing this through my computer screen versus, you know, through Zoom and everything else. This renders out amazingly good. You can really see the detail and stuff. We're still at full quality. So I'm zoomed in right now. So let's see how that looks. Yeah, the shadowing looked good, huh? I like the way it bounced and stuff. And a few sound effects and the way you go. Now, obviously I'd spend a tremendous amount more time to make clean up all the little details and stuff, but I think it's enough to get you started. Any questions so far? Okay. All right, it's 7.30. Before I move on, I'm going to, let's go ahead and take a 15 minute break. I've been staring at this for an hour, so I'm going to go ahead and stop the video. Pause the video, excuse me. Okay, everybody, why don't you go ahead and give me a hello, I'm here and stuff. We'll get going just a second here. Like I said, normally this with uh, 25 people in the class, this takes the better part of the evening and stuff. But because I just did it all, obviously there's extra time. So I'm going to do something similar to this just to demonstrate you know, why it's useful to practice these things and stuff. Okay, one of the things I'm going to show you, there's a website out there called Video Copilot by Andrew Kramer. And he has currently 136 tutorials. Now I should warn you about these tutorials. Andrew Kramer does not explain anything. Okay, he makes the assumption you already know how to do After Effects. So he doesn't explain why you're doing things, etc. But one of the things that he, I, when I ran across this, is he actually has a, uh, basically doing the exact same thing we just with, did with the die and making a cityscape with it. It's actually kind of, you know, impressive. Stuff that you can see. Building A is gonna be inside. Hey, what's up? Andrew Kramer here for Video Copilot. Now, and and welcome to the time to make the exact same thing that he does, but I do like to give credit when credit's due. And if you notice that there's a folder called building and there's some building stuff in here. So I'm just going to do a quick little demonstration. Start with going composition, new composition. Naming compositions is like really important. City view. I'm call this one city view. Okay, and I'm going to obviously stop my dice from flying around. Okay. Now the thing is, he built the entire city with basically just a handful of files. Now I'm going. This one is literally a city view like this, this giant side of the building, much higher res than we really need. But I'm not going to change the size of it. Instead, I'm going to pre-comp this layer, pre-comp this. Yeah. Building site is not a bad name for it. I'm going to move all the attributes into it. Say okay. Double click on it. Now it's still too large, but instead I'm going to sit there and go, all right. Now I could use scale and scale that, 
but I can also use the transform command, which means make it fit the comp size. Simple layer transform fit comp. Ah, so much easier, don't you think? And that's really nice. And I'm actually going to pre-comp that again. Layer pre-comp. Now, once again, I'm going to make this 3D. And I'm going to make it that's a new composition. Actually, I made a mistake. Ah, problem with trying to, I have not practiced this. That should be still okay. Because it was too big to begin with. So. Basically, I did want to make this a little bit smaller. So I would lock the aspect ratio. So you get to see that teacher often makes mistakes as well. So let's try this from the top. Now the building side this is where I'm going to have to rename things. Here's pre-comp that. Okay. Move all attributes, open that up. And from here, I want to actually change the composition settings. Okay. Now I want to make sure I have aspect ratio locked. I'm actually going to make this a much bigger comp because you can put bigger things into smaller things. But it's still, that's big, but it's still bigger than my composition. Now I'm going to go, make sure that it's selected first, layer, transform, fit to comp. Okay. Because that's bigger, it gives me an advantage. Okay. There she is. At which point I can now go ahead and basically do what I was doing before. I've got that in 3D. I need four sides of a building. And my action is fit the comp. I'm going to duplicate this one, two, three times. And I'm just going to eyeball this, okay? I'm just going to go to two views. Oops. Hold down the shift key would make a lot more sense. Rotation, 90 degrees. I'm using my arrow keys up, down, right, left to adjust this to make this fit a little bit closer. 
Actually, I didn't need to duplicate that one because what I really want to do, since that's already rotated, is just duplicate that one and bring it up to the top. There we go. And voila, I got myself a start of a building here. Not a really good one. This is why if you prep things in Photoshop, you know exactly how many pixels everything is in. Not too shabby. Oops. Now I'm going to demonstrate a problem which we haven't really talked about in 3D. If I choose scale right now, look what happened. It does scale everything, but everything is based on the exact same anchor point. Oops, or I should say the anchor point of its layer. This is why pre-comping once again, 3D collapse transformation. The other thing is that anchor point there, notice that's quasi in the center of the building. Um, everything in here is based on where that anchor point is. That's right, I fiddled with my custom view, didn't I? Uh, never mind, I can do it the other side. That's what I'm trying to fix it. So what I wanna do here is I wanna move that anchor point. Now I could just come down here and start playing with my numbers. In fact, I think I'm going to. But we have another tool. The most bizarre icon on the entire After Effects thing is this one next to our orbit tools. This dashed line, it's called the pan behind tool. The pan behind tools basic job is to move the anchor point. And in earlier versions, by the way, you see, notice how it says bracket anchor point. Uh, it didn't say that, it just said pan behind tool. It's like, okay, why are we calling these things pan behind tools and whatnot? Okay, so back to my pointer tool, or excuse me, pan behind tool. I can now move this. And if I put it into a corner, and of course, you can't tell from just one angle. So now with that anchor point in the corner, everything will grow and shrink based on its starting point and also rotation and whatnot. So I'm gonna go ahead and go back into my custom view. And I can tell that already my building's on the wrong side. So I'm going to want to do a rotation there. degrees. That's not looking too bad. And I can also do scaling. Now I can create a distortion by unlocking. And that's with a little lock chain symbol. So I can make decisions say, well, actually I want my building tall and skinny. So my X and Y. Matter of fact, I might actually want to know I have my building like that. I can also do other things as well. Oops. And I accidentally opened up the other comp. Get back to the one I was working on. Let's see this go. I'm going to go back to a custom view here, which is not as handy. This is where things always get. There we go. 
Yeah. And you can see how I just put that together very similar to my die. One of the things I probably should have also done is I have a roof I could put on this thing. So instead, I'm just going to come in here. Notice I can't see that in a 3D view. I can only see that through the camera because it's not 3D yet. Bingo. Let's go ahead and flip that around. Do a little rotation. Oops, wrong one. It's even I hit the wrong one sometimes. Yes, yeah, so I'll show you how to do the anchor point again in just a second. If I'm going to do it right now, because right now that anchor point's not in a good place for me to adjust this. The pan behind tool, which is this guy here, which is the dashed line one, allows you to grab the anchor point. And position it wherever you need it to. So now that I've got position in that corner, just move it over here. Scale. And <laughs> scale not freaking position. There we go. I can change my roof. Try this again. Move my roof over. As I'm doing a quick dirty one, Andrew's see, much more. Matter of fact, he goes through and actually makes a uh, 3D roof, adding uh, vents and other things on there. So I'm thinking of them as the mini dice on top of each other and stuff. I'm just doing this in class for your enjoyment. And also just to show you why you want to learn After Effects and what you can do with it. Now, somebody who's uh, done a lot of After Effects might ask, what about alignment? Why don't you just select those two things and use the alignment tools? This is why. In 3D, the alignment options don't work. Okay. So you got to do it either through the pixels or through the other numbers and stuff. Anyhow, so I'm going to. So that's close enough for what I want to do. I'm still floating too high above that roof. So. All right. One of the other things I can do is I make this building bigger by duplicating that comp, pulling it down to a certain level. With all that put together, I can now pre-comp that again. Building, done, okay. And as always, you gotta activate all this stuff. Now with that building done, and it's all one piece, I can take this, I'm gonna use my, this view, which is my camera view. I want to see, 100%. At which point I can sit here and go, okay, I want to duplicate that one. Let's go here, top view. So I now have two buildings. I can start building actually a cityscape here. Kind of raise this one up, slide it over a little bit more. Let's go over this way. And then of course duplicate these things. There. Let's rotate this guy. Oops, not that way you don't. Put it into 
perspective. Move this around and over. Oh, come on. Okay, yeah, I got the wrong one. I know it. So I'm just going to grab that, reposition it, etc. Now, that looks pretty boring right at the moment, right? That's because I've got this active camera. But if I put a camera in here, by changing the lens setting, it, of course, changes how much information is given to the audience. Now I can sit here and go, okay, I'm going to back this up. I'm going to actually move it a little bit higher. Move it up a little bit, tilt it down just a hair. There we go. And you can start seeing that I can get interesting things. Now they still look a little too much the same. So you can just go in, scale. Let's make this one a little fatter, shall we? Matter, squat. The Andrew Kramer tutorial that I goes through the whole thing and he actually goes in changing the lighting and stuff, etc. But from this, I can do just even a very simple animation. Give you an idea. As a matter of fact, let's try to do that. So this is a very simple camera move. Fit that window. So we're getting there. So let's actually I've got a New York skyline. Let's put that in the background. Yeah, there we go. Slowly coming together. Notice that that roof is a little bit too bright. So I need to go into that roof because it's too bright compared to everything else, right? This is where filters come in, of course. So I probably want to put in something like curves. Photoshop people should know curves. And let's just bring that down a little bit. I want to see it though. Yeah, you don't want it so dark you can't see the detail. Let's go back into the. Yeah, there we go. See how much better that looks now. Again, these practice things that we do uh, are just simply, ooh, actually my roof is farther off. You can see right there. Oh, well, I will. That's when you go back, advantage of having copy of a copy of copies, you can go back in and stuff. The tutorial will also, uh, in the video tutorial, also goes in like how to like mask out some of these lights and things so that's not all lit, how to put a glow on there, fun things like that, et cetera, et cetera. So it's a fun little thing that you can play with, you know, and stuff. But again, I want to warn you, if you try to start looking at his tutorials, many will lose you just because of the nature of the beast. You know, his stuff is very advanced. We often like to joke, professionally speaking, that the moment that his tutorial shows up, you'll see it on TV commercial. But like I said, with 130 plus, you know, they cover a wide range of material and stuff. So it's all fun, fun, fun things.
not what I want to grab. I want to grab that. Okay. Again, just to show you, you know, the possibilities of 3D and why you want to learn this stuff. Okay. So any questions on, yeah, I know I went super fast. Sorry, guys. And also, it's not one that I had memorized. I just realized uh, yesterday that I needed something to fill in a little extra time for the evening. And I remember this tutorial from seeing it way back. So I thought I'd have some fun with you guys and show it to you. Okay. So yeah, lots of possibilities, lots of fun stuff. Did I answer the anchor point question for you, by the way, that you asked? I think I went over that a couple of times. It's the pan behind tool that lets you physically grab it and move it around as opposed to trying to type in numbers and figuring it out. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, let's take change subjects then. Let us instead talk about project number three. So I'm going to stop the recording. Stop recording.